Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. With Israel and Lebanon apparently close to reaching an agreement on dividing the spoils of the sea in the eastern Mediterranean across from their respective shores, the most tantalizing question is what does Hezbollah's head, Hassan Asala, have in mind when he keeps hurling threats at Israel? Is he really willing to risk dragging his country into a war certain to follow an attack south of the border or west into the gas exploration site? Or is he only trying to take credit for Israeli concessions in a deal crucial for Lebanon's economic survival? Joining us from elsewhere in central Israel is Colonel in Reserve Ruven Ben Shalom, who is a TV7 Powers and Play co panelist, a cross cultural strategist, and associate at the Institute for Counterterrorism at Reichman University. Thank you for joining us, Colonel. Also joining us here in the studio is Professor Ephraim Inbal, who is the president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Thank you for joining us as well, Professor Inbal. And also with us in the studio, of course, is our TV7 editor at large and host of Watchmen Talk, uh, Powers in Play, and so much more, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, take it away. So uh, if uh, one uh, were to follow only cold logic, uh, the uh, answer uh, would have been quite simple. Both Israel and Lebanon uh, have a stake in uh, dividing the spoils of the sea somehow, somewhere. And a reasonable man, especially with the able uh, mediation of Mr. Hochstein, uh, can reach a compromise. However, uh, things are not so simple in the Middle East, and especially because there is no symmetry in the negotiations between a country, a nation such as Israel, and a failed state such as Lebanon, where decisions um, come up for approval um, in the uh, militia uh, ran, uh, at least jointly by Iran, called Hezbollah. So to sum it all up, chances right now, this is a caveat, right now, uh, look quite good for an agreement ratified, one should say, by Nasrallah in order to get credit for um, eking out better terms for Lebanon uh, by virtue of uh, his earlier threats. However, it could also explode into a campaign, especially on the eve of Israel's election, which are due November 1st. The Professor Inba, what is uh, your assessment of the current state of play? I think uh, that uh, the interlocutor uh, is not Hezbollah. The interlocutor sits in uh, Tehran. Hezbollah is an uh, organization subservient to Iran wishes, and uh, it is not clear indeed what the Iranians uh, really want. On one hand, uh, they have uh, every reason to uh, believe that Hezbollah can bleed somewhat Israel, uh, they may decide uh, to divert attention from the uh, nuclear talks in Vienna. Uh, they uh, have a complicated situation in, ahead of them. And it is not clear to me what the Iranians want at this stage. Uh, so uh, we'll have to see and wait. <laughs> With that being said, last week we heard the chief uh, of uh, military intelligence here in Israel speak about the fact that Hassan al happens to be a part of the Iranian establishment. He is uh, Ayatollah himself, and therefore, uh, rather than taking the directives of the Iranians, the Iranians consult with him about how to proceed on matters in Lebanon. To what degree is this taken into a, a factor or the equation when Israel is dealing with Hezbollah at this stage? Well, definitely it's true that the Iranians uh, are cautious and uh, see uh, Hezbollah and Nasrallah as an ally, and they definitely consult with him, but eventually the final decision is made uh, in Tehran. Indeed. And uh, Israel must realize this uh, situation. Colonel Ben Shalom, I'd like to hear your uh, assessment on this matter and also bring in uh, the uh, statement made by the Israeli Defense Minister, Benny Gantz, who uh, previously also served as the Chief of General Staff uh, and Commander of uh, Northern Command, among other uh, positions that he held, uh, who basically leveled a scathing threat to uh, Hezbollah and uh, its leader, Hassan Nasrallah, saying that 
attacking Israel would draw Israel into war with Lebanon and the cost that Hezbollah will have to pay is Lebanon. Is this something that is heard in Beirut at this stage? Well, absolutely. Every, every such statement, of course, has its effect. Notice how we take seriously every single statement by Hassan Nasrallah. We watch his speech, we, we, uh, we assess every word and what it means, and certainly they do the same. Personally, I don't like some of these statements coming from our side because, in a way, it's playing into the game. Um, and in general, I think recently in the Middle East, too many threats are thrown out. But in a way, the Minister of uh, Defense has no choice but to threaten when threats come from Lebanon. Now, let's look at what Hassan Nasrallah is doing. He's issuing these threats that are, excuse me, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And I'm not looking, not looking down at Hezbollah as a terror organization compared to a state, a state like Israel. I'm saying, what could he ever do to our assets that we can't do back? Now, it's critical for Lebanon country of Lebanon that's in a dire situation now to exploit these resources in the sea. Of course, that's our interest too. If they do anything to counter what we're doing or, God forbid, attack and destroy one of our assets, we could negate and annihilate every single asset they will ever have. So why in the world would they do that? So certainly that is not the calculation of the country of Lebanon. I personally don't think that's the calculation of Hassan Nasrallah himself. But they are expert negotiators. And I think we are negotiating now with Lebanon, the country, the government of Lebanon. Hezbollah, in a way, is used as a tool to put pressure, to exert pressure on Israel. Our nature is such that we fall for it. And we, I think we have seen that we are taking these threats very seriously. The more we show that we take them seriously, the more it shows them that, in a way, it's working. So that's why Israel also has been making some concessions instead of saying several months back, forget it, don't you threaten us, you know, who are you? No, we don't do that, we've been playing along, there's an American mediator, and we're doing it right and calculated, hopefully we'll get to the right place. But remember one thing, our interest is peace and stability, that is not the ultimate goal of Hezbollah. Indeed, Mr. Olin. Well, Hezbollah, of course, is the party of God, this is their religious uh, parameter. But um, they are also known as the Mukawama, the resistance. Now, resisting what? Who? Israel has left Lebanon 22 years ago. What's to resist? So uh, Nasrallah must come up uh, with uh, some uh, idea, some fantasy that he is now resisting Israeli domination of the Eastern Mediterranean. Most Lebanese know that uh, this is bogus. There's nothing to resist there. They do want to have their gas to revive their economy. But ever since Qassam Soleimani was assassinated in early 2020, Nasrallah's position vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians has uh, been enhanced markedly. He is now a co-equal to the uh, leaders of the uh, Revolutionary Guards in the councils of war in Tehran, especially as regards Lebanon. And he also has input on the religious councils, which also has significant uh, sway. Right. So, so um, uh, Nasrallah um, cannot just rely on what he's told, on the direction he's uh, been given by Tehran. He must weigh the interests of the Lebanese state, of the Shiite community, which he uh, is still uh, representing, of his party's power within the parliament and as Lebanon prepares to elect a president. These are complicated uh, calculations, but the upshot is that it does not seem in his interest to draw Israel into a war in which he may lose his own head. Professor Inbal, I'm going to challenge you on this one. Uh, when leaders maintain the seat of power for too long, usually they lose to a certain degree. Uh, they become detached to reality, if you will. Uh, is Hassan Asala detached from reality? Does he think that uh, lad might turn into mad when we're talking about the whole uh, mutually assured destruction versus Lebanon's assured destruction? 
See, I'm not sure I can authoritatively answer this question because I'm not a, an expert on Nasrallah. Nasrallah seems to be a very smart guy. Uh, and uh, he behaves uh, carefully for uh, over the years. He was successful in taking over a country. We shouldn't forget that. He still controls Lebanon. So I have a high appreciation for, uh, for his political skills. I would like to add that there is one element which was not mentioned yet, and this is the elections in Israel. We should not forget that uh, we are in a period of elections, and we are not sure what uh, Tehran or Nasrallah want to be the outcome of these elections, particularly when the differences between the two blocks is so narrow. Do they want a Netanyahu government? Do they want a leftist government? It's not clear. Uh, so uh, uh, there is this element and there, and I'm sure they are able to calculate uh, what is best for them. Uh, we don't know what it is best for them in according to their thinking. I would like to add also that uh, our lingering political crisis is, in my view, and is the view of the Israelis, eroding our deterrence. We don't look good, particularly uh, when uh, most people around us really don't know what democracy is. Even after breaking dawn? Yeah, that was a minor operation. What's dealing with uh, a minuscule terrorist organization? We should not take our successes in this operation too seriously. Indeed. Well, uh, Mr. Oren mentioned something before the program, that is that if a war does take place under uh, the premiership, at least a transitional one of Yair Lapid, uh, he will have to prove himself, and this may cost the life of Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, Colonel Ben Shalom, would you agree with Amir Oren in such an assessment? And to what degree is this calculation being deliberated within the bunker of that same man? Well, I agree to all the assessments we just heard. Um, I think I see in the Israeli establishment a lot of respect, if you can call that, for Nasrallah as a rival. Um, you know, it, on the other hand, look what he did to Lebanon. Um, what successes does he have? The only success is perpetuating this image of raising the flag of Mukawama, of resistance. But a man that led his country to, to devastation in 2006 and then said clearly he would not have done it if he knew what devastation he would lead to. And since then is hiding in a bunker and releasing these, these videos that he sounds very bold in the videos, but that's it, hiding in a bunker and releasing videos. So how much success is there? I said before what their calculation is. Their calculation, as many entities, unfortunately, in the region, is not peace and stability. This is a Western mindset. Their considerations are perpetuating instability because that's the only thing that gives them legitimacy. Who would Hezbollah be without the fight with Israel, the fake fight with Israel? And that's why nothing will ever even symbolize stability in their eyes. And not only Hezbollah, by the way, even the country of Lebanon, do you think that we, if we soon reach, reach a deal, and I think we will, do you think we'll be meeting um, at the White House for a ceremony of signing this deal, shaking hands with the Lebanese? We would love it. It makes sense. They would never allow it. Never. We're not going to see such a thing. They can't be perceived as doing anything to normalize relations with us. So unfortunately, ultimately, this will be conflict. This will be war. And as far as your discussion of what the war will look like, I think that is the war the IDF has been preparing for. Um, changing st strategic thinking, st changing tactics, preparing for a different kind of war and not preparing for the war of 2006. It would be devastating for Lebanon, certainly going directly to the top, to the national level, to Nasrallah himself. It makes sense. So, so uh, th these, this is what I see. And unfortunately, even though I think right now he's not going to lead to war, ultimately he will. And ultimately we will prevail. It will be devastating for Lebanon. Mr. Oren, obviously Hassan Nasrallah's standing has diminished over uh, the last several uh, years, especially following and particularly following the explosion in the uh, Beirut, uh, Beirut port, which uh, devastated Lebanon on many levels. And of course, reconstruction is still delayed because of the lack of reform. The IMF has not seen fit uh, that uh, uh, the efforts by the technocratic government uh, of uh, Lebanon actually was managing to make some breakthrough. Uh, nevertheless, uh, due to the sanctions, uh, the, the crippling sanctions regime of the United States on uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, we see uh, Hezbollah 
cynically utilizing its capacity, holding the Ministry, of course, of Communications and holding the Ministry of Health and, and other um, organizations within Lebanon to leech upon them, basically, for the sake of maintaining its uh, uh, military prowess. Is this something that can perpetually continue, considering the fact that without this arrangement, it's Lebanon is it's not a state anymore, is it? No, it is not. Um, the uh, Lebanese political elite is mostly composed of corrupt confessional warlords. And it doesn't matter whether uh, they are Maronite, um, like the uh, Shamuns, the Jamiles, the Farangias, the Aouns. There are two Aouns unrelated, the uh, president, Michel Aoun, and the commander of the army, Joseph Aoun, who may be the... Uh, next president, or if they are uh, Sunni, um, like several uh, prime ministers of the recent past, or Shiite like Nabi Berry and uh, Nasrallah. They um, have all grown used to sharing power in some way, fighting, we should also uh, mention the Jumblat, the, the Druze, and others. Um, so they don't really care about the nation state, which Lebanon uh, was never uh, really one. It was uh, an artificial and superficial uh, framework. So uh, for them, um, ruining Lebanon is not such a heavy price uh, to pay as long as they, their tribe, their uh, bank accounts, uh, and they are all uh, held uh, intact. And Israel may indeed this time put them in the crosshairs. So um, it is not really, uh, doesn't really make sense for Nasrallah to try Lapid and Gantz. It is true that uh, in 1996, 10 years before 2006, in Operation Grapes of Wrath, Shimon Peres overplayed his hand a few weeks before the election and then lost to Netanyahu. But history doesn't always repeat itself, and it would be too risky for any uh, Lebanese uh, power broker, including uh, Nasrallah, to take his chance now. History doesn't repeat itself when lessons are learned. The question is whether <laughs> it's happened or not. But uh, I'd like to ask you, Professor uh, Inbal, uh, there was just recently a Lebanese delegation that headed to Tehran. And they met with their counterparts uh, uh, in Tehran. And the Iranians in that meeting, uh, at least according to various reports, which uh, Iranian media cited, uh, indicated that uh, the Ayatollah regime is willing to provide oil to uh, the, the Lebanese to try and uh, basically uh, rejuvenate uh, the energy crisis in that country. Uh, do you see this as a signal that even if uh, Israel does not provide an alternative to the Lebanese, uh, Iran will seek to basically tighten its grip on that country. And winter is coming, and it's very harsh in Lebanon. Indeed. Yeah, I was in the mountains of Shuf, uh, so I know it was cold, very cold there. Uh, yeah, definitely. They did it uh, with Syria. So uh, this is uh, definitely a, a possibility. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, react to this scenario of Lebanon disappearing. I don't see too many states disappearing because of the corruption of their leaders or, or because of bankruptcy. You know, a state basically is a good business. And eventually politicians, including Abu Mazen, will continue to hold on to their state because they can make money, they can be good parents, they can be good family men. And uh, precisely because there is corruption, uh, the state will continue. And if I may, I would like to add another thing. Uh, I actually would welcome a miscalculation on part of Hezbollah because uh, we have to get rid of the uh, missile threat from, from Lebanon. And this will be a wonderful excuse uh, to get rid of this threat uh, before. An excuse with a cost, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. So you would provoke a crisis? Uh, I would be careful because I want legitimacy. But this is why I said that I would welcome a miscalculation on part of Hezbollah. And there is another reason to do it. Uh, this is the Abraham Accords. The stability of the Abraham Accords are dependent upon 
Israel taking care of Iran. This is a deal. The Gulf states really don't need Israel, you know, for tourism, uh, for uh, technology, for all those things. They have enough money to buy everything they need. And the only thing that we can deliver and others cannot, particularly not the United States, is taking care of the Iranian nuclear option. So uh, this is why it is very important to show a very muscular response to Lebanon in order to preserve the Abraham Accords and lessen the cost of Israel in case of a military operation in Iran. Well, this is an interesting uh, um, school of thought, of course. I'd like to ask you- Lawrence of Arabia would have been amazed at the upheaval in which the Arab revolt of a hundred years ago now becomes um, a Western style military like Israel's becoming the Gulf States foreign legion. Indeed. Well, um, time will tell about whether sure. this will uh, uh, ultimately uh, bear fruit. But uh, I'd like to ask you, Colonel uh, Ben Shalom, obviously you're also a fellow at the ICT at Reichland University. Last week we had the conference there and we had National Security Advisor Yal Khulata speak about the fact that if Hezbollah is not in the equation of Lebanon, Lebanon would have been the the next state in uh, the circle of peace uh, within the context of the Abraham Accords, um, taking the analogy that uh, we just heard of uh, Professor Inbao for potential miscalculation with all the consequences thereof, uh, which will be devastating on both sides, something that neither Israel nor the Lebanese people uh, would want to see uh, happen. Uh, do you see a reality in which uh, the demise of Hezbollah would turn the equation of the entire Middle East? I have to say yes, and I have to say that I wish that would happen. But for the last 30 years, I've heard so many times Israelis speak about something that is soon going to happen, or some terror leader is soon to be out of the picture, or the leader of one regime, his days are numbered. And I see that these are powerful entities, powerful people, and they cling to power, and they sustain and perpetuate the situation. So I don't see Lebanon changing in the near future. The only change I see is negative. Going back to the whole discussion we just had, unfortunately, when you look at the history of Lebanon, they've been through some tough times. They've been through 15 years of civil war. And uh, uh, going back to 19, uh, 1910 and 1920, when actually looking at themselves, who are we? You know, who, what, 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 are the, what is the balance of power? And once in a while coming up with these unique mechanisms that sort of hold. Uh, and by the way, relative to that, they did a great job. It's an interesting, fascinating, uh, complex country, but they could they could crumble in moments. I think it's more a social thing. In a way, it's surprising it didn't happen so far. So I don't see Hezbollah relinquishing power. I don't see Iran uh, lessening its grip. I think everything we're going to see now is going to promote uh, Hezbollah's interest, certainly Iran's interest, even to the point of being perceived as the savior of Lebanon with that kind of assistance you were talking about. So. To the point of your question of normalizing relations with Israel, I don't see it happening. One point I just want to make, as a military officer in reserve preparing for the next war, you would think that in a way I'm waiting like to carry it out. I would say absolutely not. Not looking for miscalculation. Don't want to see a confrontation. I think it's going to be bad for everybody. And even we're not going to be able to stop the rockets because you don't stop rockets. So I would not want to see that happen. That's With that being said, Mr. Oren. Uh, do, you, do you know how many prime ministers has Nasrallah seen come and go in Israel in the 40 years he has been in power? With an average of two years per... I, no, no. When, when Reuven was speaking, I counted them. Indeed. Nine. Uh, from Shamir to Lapid. Th uh, there's a chance he may see a tenth one or someone who has already been in power return to the prime minister's office before we see another leader of Hezbollah. Indeed, but of course, taking into the equation uh, the tens of thousands of statistical rockets and, and several thousands of uh, precision guided munitions, uh, the, the fact of the matter is this deterrent is what enables Iran from entrenching militarily in Syria and uh, obviously challenges Israel's ability to uh, maintain well, its not, red not lines. really, because Israel is deterred from hitting Lebanon proper. It is not being deterred from hitting Iranian targets in Syria. 
Indeed. Nevertheless, the question is, to what degree are the Iranians sure that Israel is deterred about That's this true. equation? Uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program. There is a closing sentence for each professor, and we'll start with you. Uh, I would say that uh, a preemptive war could save uh, a lot of trouble to Israel in the future. And I think it would be a mistake not to consider it. Indeed. Well, Colonel Menchelo. I will always use this platform in case Lebanese are listening to understand how important for Israel it is stability and peace and good neighborly relations. And I hope this resolved. And another point is international pressure always has to go to stabilization. There's a lot of pressure to put on Lebanon, on Syria, on Iran for positive for the positive sake of peace and stability. Ironically, the closest characteristics between nations in the context of the Middle East is Lebanese people and Israelis, uh, something that we can see also a lot abroad, where they connect uh, more often than not. Mr. Owen, your closing sentence? Well, the terms um, preemption or prevention and uh, Lebanon have gone out of vogue when Begin tried them for, uh, some 40 years ago and uh, failed. So um, one does not see any government in Israel risk preemption in Lebanon. It will wait and see how it all unfolds. So the statements about preemption and initiation by IDF Chief of General Staff, Lieutenant General Aviv Kochavi is just rhetoric? No, if, if the um, uh, missiles are on the launchers and if Radwan forces are going to um, infiltrate Israel, Yes, they will be preempted, but not a preventive war. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Professor Inbal, Colonel Ben Shalom, and Mr. Owen for being part of today's program, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time for yet another episode of Jerusalem Studio. Until then, Shalom. Shalom.